I think we need to take ownership of ourselves. And I think this idea that you project all this criticism, all this repudiation, all this negation out onto the institutional world is a cheap and, and ineffective form of therapy, right? Or of avoidance even. I think we ought to all, our harshest questions ought to be our, about our own behavior. What am I doing wrong? What ought I to change in my interactions with my family, my community, my fellow citizens? How have I contributed to either making things worse or making things more functional and better? This is Sachin. And this is Eric. Welcome to Luminary, kitchen table style conversations with some of the world's brightest minds exploring boundaries of human knowledge. Join us on a pursuit to transmit intuition and ideas. Find us at luminary.fm or on Twitter at luminaryfm. We would love to hear from you. Why are technology and software an integral part of change and shaping the world around us? We seek to dissect this question in the second season of Luminary. It's arguably at the heart of defining our trajectory as a civilization. Through a vast series of topics, our ambition is to weave a narrative incorporating a social, technical, historical, and philosophical lens, with contributions from titans of technology, theorists, builders, and tinkerers alike. If you have ideas, feedback, or simply suggestions for who to talk with, drop us a line on Twitter. The spirit of this journey is collaborative and community-oriented. Our guest today is Martin Gurry, a visiting research fellow at Marketer's Center and a former CIA analyst. Martin's core interests center around politics, information, and media. His book, The Revolt of the Public, received notoriety for its cogent analysis of the effects of information on political change. Our conversation with Martin centers around the societal and political implications of how information is organized and controlled. We launch into Martin's thesis in The Revolt of the Public, which tells the story of how insurgencies, enabled by digital devices in a vast information sphere, have mobilized millions of ordinary people around the world, and talk about what's changed since the book was last published in 2018. We discuss the evolution of technology and information structure and its implications for how societies are organized, the nature of the current political discord, and democracy. Martin also offers some practical advice for engaged citizens and aspiring politicians. Martin, really excited to have you with us. Honored and excited. I think an interesting starting point could just be what inspired you to study political change? What's been the motivation behind a lot of work and study in, in the field of political change? If you want to go deep into personal origin story. My life has been a function of political change. I was born in Cuba at a time when it was, let's put it this way, my very earliest memory was my parents told me, don't look out the window because it's going to be a shootout. And I, of course, was three years old. I was like a cowboy. So I looked out the window and of course it was the exact opposite. This is a very busy street and there wasn't a soul out there. This was when this general called Batista rolled out his tanks and overthrew Cuba's democracy. And I'm not going to tell you how old I am because you probably pass out, but that was a long time ago. All right. And poor Cuba hasn't had a moment of democracy since. Of course, Castro overthrew Batista many years later and my family fled from that two years after he took over the country. So I am a creature of political change. If you want a more immediate reason is that I worked for CIA for many years and got to analyze and study media with a view to what was changing in these societies. Obviously, nobody's interested in stable states. If you're the president or a member of the cabinet, yes, today is going to be just like yesterday. Nobody cares about that. They're looking for something new and different. And how can you tell that? And CIA, that is its mission. It's not particularly good at it, but that is its mission. I was very privileged. I mean, I was in what might be the least sexy corner of CIA. I was an analyst of global media. But of course, as the digital earthquake generated that information tsunami and the world changed, I was in a privileged position to see that. It's fair to say that political change is deeply personal to you. Yes, totally. 
I grew up with I Love Lucy. I mean, it was like whatever was happening in the United States, people was very Americanized. The middle classes were. So you know, when I came to this country, I had to learn the language, which was tricky. But when you're young, it happens right quick. But culturally, it, there, there was no shock. So you had this island that was pretty modern and had great media, good, good TV, very enterprising. And then you turn it into what it's become. It's this weird sort of museum state for Marxism Latinism, <laughs> where it's a very fertile country where you drop a seed in the ground and you got, you can live off of that for the rest of your life. People have to import food because they can't grow it. The, the system is so inefficient that it can't grow food. I witnessed that. I witnessed that. So you, you ask questions. What went wrong with Cuba? It's like a, it really is like a Greek tragedy. What went wrong with this? Cubans, I like to think, are very intelligent, very go-getting, very hardworking. What went wrong with Cuba? And you ask questions like that, and it puts your mind on a plane where you can apply those questions everywhere else. What's going wrong with the United States? Got to ask the same question. You've written extensively about political change, about change in general. Your book, The Revolt of the Public, is an excellent manifestation of that. What was your thesis behind writing that book? Yeah, that was, that was a culmination of what I and a group of people, because I don't want to pretend like it's just me, at CIA, in that little corner of CIA where the media flowed in, I'm accused of being prescient and prophetic and whatnot. That is not true. I believe, in principle, nobody can be that. Having sat at CIA, which that was his mission, and watching it fail at that. But I was in a very high perch. And I could see farther, farther out. And so could many of us who were sitting in that perch, that things were coming that, in general, the people who make decisions were not aware of. We watched this. You have to understand that you probably can't. Both of you guys, I'm looking at you, you're too young. You have to understand how much of a trickle open information was in the 20th century. It was very little, all right? If the president asks you, well, what's going on in France? You know, you had two newspapers you went to. Britain, it was a BBC, one thing, right? We lived in this fairly tidy, very limited world. And all of a sudden, that information tsunami swept across. We were in a state of shock. We had these sources that we called authoritative. So you went to Le Monde, you went to the BBC. And then suddenly we had these millions, literally millions of sources. What are these things? And of course, once we got over the shock, over the volume, what we realized, and that was probably after I left government, I thought about that. We're all talking about that constantly. And then I left government and I did some thinking on my own. I realized what was important wasn't the volume, but the effects. Information structure has effects. It sets the stage and arranges the props for the human drama. So you have to play it the way it's set. You can't escape it. As that information tsunami was rolling across the world, as different countries digitized at very different rates, you could see behind that ever-growing levels of social and political turbulence. The revolt of the public began with a question that sounds very naive today because we all are aware of these effects. But at the time, we were all asking, so this is just like a communication device. Why is it changing so many things? Why is people so upset? Why are we hearing these voices in places like Egypt, for example, that are so different and say such different things than anything we have heard before? And that led in the end to my thesis of the revolt of the public. You set forth some very important concepts in the book. You've defined what a public is. You've also defined the elites. You've defined network public. And most important, starting with the fifth wave. Could we talk a bit more about these concepts? Let's start with fifth wave and how do you view defining these concepts? That follows from what I said before. Every structure of information arranges society in such a way that certain things are facilitated and certain things are made increasingly more difficult. So if you look at the history of information, it doesn't seem to incrementally grow. It pulses. It has these waves that sweep across the landscape and like the information tsunami that followed the digital earthquake, leave almost nothing untouched. 
if you look at the invention of writing, hieroglyphic writing, it lends itself, itself to a society that is controlled by a mandarin class or a priestly caste that is basically spends his entire life learning thousands of symbols that they can communicate with. If you look at the invention of the alphabet, well, think about the republics, the classic republics of Greece and Rome. Without an alphabet, those could not have existed. I would just went to Athens and fascinating to see the names for ostracisms. They used to write a little potsherds, the names of the, of the aristocrat they wanted to exile. And there you see it. These are people who could write Themistocles and Aristides, and you see it right there. So that was the second wave of information. The third wave was possibly the most disruptive of all, and that was the printing press. We only got the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and the Scientific Revolution because of that, and that's only the beginning. The fourth wave was mass information, which is essentially the way countries dealt with the eruption into history of tens of millions of people in the 19th and early 20th century, people who had become educated, had become affluent, needed or felt they needed to understand the world around them. So you had the daily newspaper, you had later on the radio, the television. And the fifth wave, of course, is the digital earthquake. This a massive amount, even through mass information, like I said before, that was my day as a young analyst at CIA. It was a trickle. We are now de dealing with it, and our entire institutional structure is set up to deal with a trickle of information, more or less controlled from above, and monopolized from above. And now you have this wave of information gushing from below, sweeping at these institutions. What I say is, we're in early days. We have no, everybody's yelling and screaming and what's going on. Hold on, strap on your seatbelts. This is only the beginning. It took 150 years for the human race to figure out what to do with the printing press. It probably won't take that long with the digital dispensation because things move faster today, but I'm not going to live to see the end of this. You guys might, but I won't. But I think you're saying that one big factor that shifted from the fourth wave to the fifth wave is that consumers of information became producers of information. How important is that factor in the fifth wave? It's critically important. And I think... You have to go back and ask why, again, why would the system of communication have such tremendous political implications? How does that work exactly? Today, it seems natural that the internet roils our politics. At the time, nobody thought that. The reason is we have institutions, including our democratic institutions, political parties, for example, our government institutions that are dependent on authority. And authority is my ability to ask you to do something and get you to do it without pointing a gun at your head. And how does that happen? I have a story of legitimacy about how I get to ask this favor or this thing from you. I spent many years in, in medical school and I would wear a smock. I'm a doctor. I'm an authority. You will listen to me when it comes to health. Or I come from the best Roman families. I wear a toga. So you will listen to me when it comes to lawmaking. There are stories of legitimacy. And the story of legitimacy that our institutions were based on was that they could basically fix the democratics and we're not, but they all had this high utopian ambition that they could fix the human condition by applying power, wealth, and just science, I guess you would call it. What this eruption of information from below has done is that those stories are now blown up. They're just blown up. You're seeing that they have the people, the elites who basically manage the institutions that benefited from those stories are in a state of panic. Okay. Because every time they make a mistake, every time they do something, they have a sexual escapade, for example, every time they say something silly, it is everywhere. It's exposed everywhere. We are in a crisis of authority. We are in a moment when, in the 1960s, for example, when you became president, that by itself conferred you a gigantic trust. Even if you were uncertain about this guy who just got voted in, you felt he's the president now. Let's give him, give him a chance to prove himself. We used to say that people rise to the presidency, the level of the presidency, even though they seem to be not that smart before. Now it's the actual opposite. The second somebody gets elected to the presidency, they become the focus of all this distrust and loathing antagonism because the, the institution conveys distrust rather than the opposite. And of course, 
when you have that, nothing works right. Nothing works. We can talk about it. It's a weird battle between a public, basically batters at institutions without offering to reform them, smashes at society without trying to conjure up alternatives, which leads in the end to nihilism, which is the belief that destruction is a form of progress. And an elite class on the other side, that seems to be totally performative. They have decided, well, we can't do anything here. These institutions that used to be really levers of action to guide and change and navigate events in the, in the world, they don't see that that way. They're just stages for them to strut in. So we have this elite class that has completely given up the idea that they should be shaping these institutions to the digital age. They just want to look good. They just want to strut. They want to be celebrities. It's hard to pick a side in this on this conflict. I think we both have to grow up a little bit. Both sides have to grow up a little bit before we can pick a side. Can you just define elites? It's a very simple definition. We have these institutions that essentially manage the modern world. You're talking about politics, of course, but you're also talking about business. You're talking about media. You're talking about the university. You're talking about foundations, nonprofits. These institutions are run by a specific class that it sounds like they do very different businesses, but if you look at what they say, they speak the same language. And it's a weird language. It's a language of things that are of interest to them that the people, what I call the public, looks and listens and goes, well, why are you talking about those subjects? I'm looking at my supermarket shelves and they're empty or something that is completely eludes the elites because they live in a different socioeconomic world. So the elites basically are those who manage that. They used to be the source of authority and there are people still who believe they should be. So the elites, it's not like a tiny little group of people in the revolt of the elites. I think Lash puts it at like 15%. I think David Goodhart's makes it 30%. I mean, it, these are just numbers, but it's not like a tiny group of people. It's actually quite a large number of people managing these institutions. Are you a part of the elite? That's a really good question. I got a piece coming on something along the lines of everything you want to know about elites, but we're afraid to ask. Okay, you apply my criterion. When I was a CIA, yes, I was an elite because I was upholding that institution. When you live inside those institutions, you carry that. You represent then I left government. Then I would became this ordinary person and hey, this is great, which is probably what I belong. Then Mercatus sent a place. And what I loved about it was the title. So I'm a visiting fellow. And that's what I do at Mercatus. I visit. So I'm sort of like an intermittent elite right now. <laughs> when I'm there, I'm on. When I'm home, like now, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. The perception driven by the information tsunami is really different and how it impacts behaviors, et cetera. You did mention information structure and how information structure has changed. What is the taxonomy of the information structure or the change you're alluding to? Okay, and very simply, mass media, which is the fourth wave, was just God sent for elite control. It was, and you look at the old mainstream newspapers and old, TV broadcast, you realize that these are elites talking to themselves. So essentially, the idea, which was pretty much created in the 19th century, but it lasted pretty much through the 20th, was just tailor-made for elite control. There was, I talk, and that could be you're the owner and the editor of a newspaper. You listen. And as I said, we got to watch the elites talk. We, there was the illusion they were talking at us. But when... These were all topics of interest to the elites. We kind of accepted that because why? Guess what? We could not talk back. There was no way of talking back. You could yell at your TV set. I did that actually back in the day, but they couldn't hear you. All right. So the transformation has been now, not only does the public talk back, it screams and it has to scream for structural reasons because when you're in the middle of a tsunami, which is really to shift quite abruptly my metaphors, it's the Tower of Babel where everybody is trying to make uh, sense of what's going on. If you just speak very moderately and very quietly, lost. You have to scream. So the elites have this roar coming at them. 
almost entirely of rage and discontent. The authority that mass media conveyed on these people to talk about togas, Walter Cronkite is this man who looked like the most successful member of your family that the kids all with you from the rest of the family gets pointed to, you should grow up to be like Uncle Walter. If he had just the book, the, the look, the voice, he commanded authority, but it was a look, it was a voice. When you listen to, to Cronkite after he left CBS News, he was just a shallow man. He had nothing to say. That was the institution conferring authority on him. That is gone. That is gone. And of course, even TV news today, there's all this silly chatter and the subjects are the equivalent of clickbait. So you have runaway brides or it's some airplane goes down in the ocean and they're talking about it for the three months. The sense that these people convey authoritative information has been exploded by the new, the new structures. So the taxonomy today is bottom up. It used to be top down. If you want a totally funky metaphor. As I said, the system, the structure of information sets the stage and arranges all the props. You got to play it as it lays. Our structure today is for a Marx Brothers movie. The elites hate that. The elites want Hamlet. So they're trying to force Hamlet on this Marx Brothers stage set. But unfortunately, it's Groucho playing Hamlet and there are pratfalls involved. You can't force it to what it's not. The elites want to be serious. They want to be Walter Cronkite. They can't. This is a crazy system, a crazy structure. And until we adapt our society and our institutions to this new structure, there's going to be profound and not just political cult conflict, but cultural and social conflict as well. Two other important concepts which came through when you spoke about the information structure is the public and the network public which is potentially giving this feedback loop much more stronger than ever before. Could you expound on how you define public and, of course, yeah. not work public? Yeah, I took my definition of the public, and I should say right off the bat that the public is not the people, even though when you look at the public as it erupts in protests or whatever, it always claims to be the people. The public is not the masses, because that's a very old-fashioned 20th century sociological concept. It's not even 100% the crowd on the streets, although in the day of the cell phone, there's a fairly intimate relationship between the two. I took my definition from Walter Lippmann, a brilliant political writer in a book called Public Opinion, that the public is simply any group that is inter interested in a particular affair can affect it by demonstrating its opinions in a public way. So in the old days, you'd write letters to the editor and have those campaigns or today, of course, you create some website and you can flood the digital world with your screams of anguish or whatever it is you're upset about. And the public in the digital age is a very peculiar organism. It isn't one. It's many, obviously. It's interested in a particular affair, which is what Lippmann says. Then depending on the affair, you get different publics. And it's very divided and it can mobilize and basically be energized only when it's against, when it is, when it's repu the act of repudiation. If you look, for example, at the crowd in Tahrir Square that, that was mobilized by the affair of getting rid of Hosni Mubarak, there were socialists, atheistic socialists, they, the groups like that, there were Normal Egyptian people who were some were religious, some more so, some less so. There were the Muslim Brotherhood youth. The parent organization stayed up, but the young people came. And several other very disparate groups that if you had asked them, what kind of Egypt do you want after you overthrow Hosni Mubarak, they would start fighting with each other. But they remained united in the affair of getting rid of They hated Mubarak. So the second they stopped, bashing the institutions, the, the public kind of disintegrates into its component parts. The structural see, is to continue to rage, to continue to bash and smash at the institutions. You saw what happened to the crowd in Terrier Square after they did get rid of Mubarak. They just left and two old-fashioned top-down institutions, the Egyptian military and the Muslim Brotherhood, slugged it out for control. Yeah, I would like to ask you a little bit about 
to what extent your thesis might have changed or to what extent you might want to update your thesis. But just so we understand crisply, your thesis seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, there is a technology enabled shift in individual capability that has led to an erosion of trust in established institutions. Yes. Is that kind of the heart of your thesis? It's more than an erosion. Yes, it, that is the beginning of the thesis. It has led to a very profound, I think we're in the middle of a very profound transformation of which that is part, all right? It's not just a lack of loss of trust. There's a loss of comprehension. There's a fragmenting of society into war bands. It's everything, fra fragmenting at many levels, I think. I'm old enough that I remember what it felt like everything was cohering. You had the European Union and you had the United Nations and everything seemed to be, and you had all these oh, agreements about tariffs and everything was that we were living in the same big world. And then at a certain moment, everything started to crack apart. It started with the Soviet Union, but it's been going on ever since. You have that going on at the moment. Where it's going to end, I don't think you or I can ever tell, but uh, and I, I would love to see it. To what extent would you want to update or amend your thesis. You wrote the book in 2014. And of course, the book you did publish with Stripe Press had an additional chapter called Reconsiderations. So is there anything you would want to add to the, to the book that was published in 2018? Absolutely. That's what I'm working on right now. I feel like, well, to every, in, in politics, as, as in physics, every action has a reaction. And I think we're in a moment of very intense reaction. I think it took the elites. Honestly, when I published the book in 2014, I felt like people looked at me like I was crazy. The elites were absolutely clueless about what was coming for them, right? I think 2016 with Brexit and Trump, they woke up. <laughs> the elites woke up. And I think ever since they have been groping for, okay, how do we... How do we go back to the 20th century? How do we find that time machine that puts us back in, in charge and gives us back our authority? I think starting with COVID, the pandemic, they found a way of not necessarily regaining authority, but of gaining control so that you could, for example, trump out of social media, basically silence him, right? You could, if you felt like it was in your interest of your class, to call Hunt Biden's infamous laptop a Russian disinformation campaign, even though there it was. And by the way, if you know anything about disinformation, it was nothing like a disinformation. There was no single trait about that that was a disinformation campaign. I don't know what that laptop holds, but you can do that. You can say, yes, nobody's allowed to say that this is anything other than. So you have a moment of reaction, and I think it helped to overthrow Trump. Yeah, I think there has been a, a, an element that was not touched on in the book that I feel poses the question, can the elites regain control? It, it would be true control. It would not be something we grant them. It would just be using a lot of words like disinformation and Russian involvement and stories like that to deny certain opinions any airtime and basically just smother them and broadcast their own opinions much more loudly. And what I have called, I haven't called it, my friend Andre Mir has called post-journalism, which is essentially turning journalism into a creed. It's part of that. The Washington Post kept a tally of Trump lies. By the end, it was in the tens of thousands. And I'm not disputing that. The guy had trouble figuring out what was true. But the New York Times, published literally thousands of stories on the Trump-Russia collusion. In every one of those, he was either explicitly or implicitly culpable of being essentially a Russian agent. So this is equally, nobody counts those a lot. Both sides have lost complete perspective on the truth. The difference is the elites can silence one side. And because this is not true, this is from saying that an election was rigged is banned in many social media. They put all these little flags and say, well, you can't say that. Oh my gosh, I can't think of anything that is more American than to say we was robbed. Practically everybody who has ever lost in this country has said that, all right? You can be wrong and these people are almost certainly wrong, but you have a right to say that if you want to without getting little stickers saying this is not true. My concern is 
where does it lead? Where does this lead? Here's a good example. Elon Musk on Twitter. He says, I want to make Twitter. I'm a fundamentalist on free speech. I have never in my very long years heard people criticize free speech. In this country, it was like apple pie. So if you wanted a certain point of view, not to gain a lot of credence, you came up with all ways of saying, well, free speech, to actually openly, nakedly say free speech is racism or whatever. That's pretty shocking. I think the elites in their panic have sort of lost their minds, but they've been pretty successful at keeping out the opinions they don't like. And that's new. And I'm not sure where that's headed. And that's actually a project I'd like to engage in. Changing gears a bit, what is the relationship between information and technology? Well, I mean, in this case, it, but as I guess in every case, it's practically the same word. You couldn't have had books without the Moodle type technology. What that meant was, for example, if you were a scientist, you didn't have a little manuscript that some scribe had copied with God knows how many errors, because when you're copying, you're falling asleep. But you had whatever the original findings were in a journal or in a book, everybody's reading the same thing. If there's an error, it gets caught and it gets fixed. The scientific revolution couldn't have taken place without the technology to print books and journals. In this particular case, of course, information has granted anybody the right to broadcast, the right to be an author, universal authorship. This is a gigantic babble of voices, 4 billion potential speakers at the same time. This has never happened in history, never come close to happening in history. The competition for attention has been accelerated to critical mass by just the technology that made the web and the digital world. And let us add the smartphone possible. Because really until the smartphone, you were at home doing things. The smartphone has made it so that we can see when cops are beating up on people. We can see when crowds are gigantic. And in the old days, if you were a dictator and you had a protest against you, you made sure that you captured some little corner like that looked very meager. But you can't do that anymore because you have those like in Chile, a million people that look going all the way down the avenues. You're broadcasting the strength of your protests. So without the cell phone, you couldn't have done that. Technology and information, it's almost the same thing. Technology provides that structure that I was talking about. And then the structure generates the actual information, but it generates it in a specific way, in a very specific way. We tend to think of information as just we learn little bits of truth or facts or whatever, but that's not the way it works, really. That's not the way it works at all. And how about the relationship between technology and political change? That's not as intimate, I guess. But when you have one of these huge waves, technology-born waves, then everything, so tech, not, not political change, it's just change, right? Everything changes. Again, you guys are probably too young to marvel, but I still, one of the great things about being an old guy is you never get over the fact that I can, A, put my freaking credit card number online, okay, out there in the world and trust that it will not be stolen, push a button, and the next day, sometimes the same day if I want to, there's a package on my door. Revolutionary. That is revolutionary. And it is revolutionizing a gigantic set of businesses. I have an article chapter in my book where I look at this little mall, this shopping mall that I sometimes go to just to walk in. It's very, she very fancy. And I always wondered, is this like a mafia front? Because there's no, never anybody there. But it seemed to just basically by, by selling very expensive merchandise seem to survive. And the point of the chapter was, even though institutions are, seem to be c collapsing, Capitalism seems to be doing okay. That's still true, but that little mall has a lot of empty stores today. A lot of empty stores. I'm not sure it's going to survive. Th that is part of the change that is not just political change. It's, it's change. It's cultural change. Another thing, the idea that I push another button. And I have a stream of movies and shows. In the old days, we used to run to sit in our family room, turn on the TV, sit back, 
because we didn't have a remote control switch. A remote control switch is probably one of the most disruptive things that have been invented that nobody talks about. Basically, if we were going to watch TV, we probably watch the same channel for three hours at prime time. Now it's like, what am I going to watch today? I want anime. No, no, no. I, I want comedy. No, no, no. I, I want, I want so this show. I want that show. It's Westworld. It's this. It's the other. Infinite amounts of, of material. All pretty crappy, I have to say. I think we went through a golden age about five years ago. I think it's pretty much over. Mostly crappy, but you get a variety. You have children's stuff. You have traditional, the old classics. You have the new stuff, and the new stuff can be fairly straightforward. It can be pretty racy. It can be religious. There are books, there are series about Jesus. You can basically suit your tastes. You have no idea what a difference that is. It sets it up to, okay, how much entertainment can one person absorb? Because in the old days, that was decided by the structure. There wasn't that much. Today, it's endless. You can spend your entire day just kind of you know, streaming. You go do it. They call it binging for a good reason. Yeah. It's fascinating to hear you reflect on this. Anything else you would add in terms of just the relationship between technology and political change? I mean, it really is kind of force multiplier. The magnitude is very important, but anything else, any nuance that you think is important to highlight at all? Yeah, I think all those eruptions from below, all those protests sort of began with the sadly misnamed Arab Spring. Pretty much ran all the way through 2019. There, was, there were like 25 major street protests. And then came the pandemic and everything is still erupt, but it's on a different framework now. I think the way the public organizes is very different from the way it used to be. And that is technologically driven. In the olden days, if you wanted radical political change, you needed some kind of organization, top-down organization, a tiny little copy of what the elites had. You needed a printing press. And then of course you needed an ideology a program for change that you wanted. And then you wanted to take power so you could implement all these things. You needed all of that. You couldn't get anywhere without it. You might not get anywhere with it, but you needed to have that at a minimum. Today, you need none of those things. Everybody organizes on online. There are no leaders to these protests. There are no organizations. They have no organizational structures. There's no equivalent of the revolt of the public Bolshevik party. The ideologies are just like washes, flavors. If you are, for example, Occupy Wall Street, you have kind of a lefty flavor, but you look at what they say and there's no coherence. There's no ideological coherence. If you are the yellow vest in France, you have a kind of a righty flavor, but there's even less coherence there, right? So you have that very fractured public with absolutely no positive vision of what needs to be replaced. What do you put in place of what you want to tear down? mobilized around its anger at the status quo. That is possible because of the web entirely. Every last one of these movements began online. And it's very fascinating because they invariably surprise the elites. The elites always go, who the hell are these people? Where are they coming from? Who, what elite group are they associated with? Are these like labor unions or, and no, this is the public. It's a completely unorganized explosion from below. And both the ability to do that and the form it takes are dictated by the technology. The one simple framework to understand how technology interacts with political change is simply as a coordination mechanism. Is that correct yeah. in your mind? Yeah. Well, coordination, communication, yeah. W wouldn't communication ultimately boil down to coordination? If we want to, assemble at Tahir Square or at any other place physically, we need to be able to coordinate that in order to coordinate, we communicate. No, I think there are distinct functions. I think you coordinate, for example, in Egypt, this young man called Wael Ghanim, brilliant young guy, I think he was at the time marketing head for Google, put up this website. It, it was called We're All. It was the name of somebody who had been killed by the regime, a young man had been killed by the regime. So it was a, he was in Dubai, so he was safe. And he could, enormous following in Egypt, communicating opposition to the regime in a fairly, he was a marketing, he was not ranting or railing. It was a, a very modern way of protest. So that's communication. You're creating a place, a community almost, where everybody communicates. And then he said, on this particular day in January of 2011, Let's meet in Tahrir Square and on police day, that's what it was, and protest because who wants to celebrate police day if you're in a democracy? A million people saw that Facebook invitation. 
100,000 people said they were going to attend, of which probably just a fraction attended. Three weeks after the initial protest that Boyle Ghanim called for, Hosni Mubarak was gone. It's both coordination, let's show up at Tahrir Square, but it's also, let's talk about it. Who are, whenever he, for example, this is very much a modality in these groups, whenever there was a dispute, do we believe this or that? Are we for this or are we against it? There was always a vote. He put it up for a vote in his Facebook page. And then they decided that's the way they moved on. So there was, com there was communication going on about what the set of, of ideas were that they were opposing to what was going on with Mubarak. And then there was coordination in let's show up, let's show up. And he had, by the way, before that, had worked with smaller gatherings in a, I think in a very clever way, trying to get people using essentially marketing techniques. Is it fair to say that the cost of revolting or expressing views and ideas has gone down significantly with technology. That's one. And following up from that, is there, like you mentioned, that there may not be a big vision or ideas being put forward. It's more that there is a frustration which may be coming through during these revolts, etc. Maybe is it that the technology, just because it has been easy to share information, not led to the germination of the vision, which would have happened previously because in general, you would have had to approach it from a top-down structure, et cetera. Is there something to that? Yeah, I think basically elites talk to each other, decide what's important. If their framework wasn't working, then you would have the end of World War II We've beaten the Nazis. What do we do about the Soviets? And so there is discussion. And in the end, you come up with a new framework. Okay, we got the Cold War. We got it. So the elites could work this through. When you have literally hundreds of millions of individuals just speaking either in websites or on their own, on a blog or whatever, or a chat room, you can't, you, you can coordinate roughly. You can say, we'll show up somewhere, but you can't coordinate a an ideology, a new ideology, say a digital ideology that tells you what democracy should look like in the digital world. Theoretically, and everybody thought that at the beginning, things should become more democratic in the digital dispensation. We all have more of a voice. And then there are ways of measuring opinion where you just push a button and say, do you like this? Elon Musk just asked, should we bring Trump back to Twitter? 15 million or something people answer that. And it gives you some sense of how divided we are. And I think it's 52 to 48. Yeah, let's bring him back. But that's the digital world, right? And Elon Musk is kind of like a leftover from the initial wave of let, the digital world is actually a democratizing phenomenon. But the problem is there needs to be a framework, a story, a narrative that provides authority, a restoration of authority. And it's very hard, I think, probably impossible for hundreds of millions of people all needing to scream just to be heard, much less listen to intently to coordinate that, to coordinate the drafting, the crafting of a new ideological framework, which explains what democracy should look like when your thoughts move at the speed of light. This relates to the follow-on question as well. What is the role of information monopolies or information control and its influence on democracy? That's an interesting question. I think if you just take American history, all right, our foundation was essentially, we were a, a, a republic of gentlemen, of 18th century gentlemen. So everybody was very touchy about being trod upon their individual rights. But on the other hand, a lot of people were left out. And their, the newspaper life and the media life of, of the founding fathers was crazy. It was like the internet. They called each other names that you probably even today couldn't say because you get sued. So it was, and it was completely and openly partisan. In other words, you knew who was funding. Jefferson funded one newspaper, Hamilton. The New York Post was started by Hamilton. And they made no secret of who their targets were. So then you had all these millions of people being brought into the system, right? This is not a democracy, a, a, a republic of gentlemen anymore. It's, it's women, it's minorities, it's everyone. And everyone is much more educated than they were then. You needed some, somehow 
manage that. And I think the information technology of the day did that very well. It was very top down. And so you always got put into kind of mass organization, your political parties. In the 20th century, 10 guys got together in a room and decided who the candidate was going to be, right? It was like papal conclaves have more democracy than the way presidential candidates got nominated in the 20th century. And everybody was fine with that. You got to say yes or no a lot. It's like in television, for example, you had three channels. I got to say yes or no to them or switch the damn thing off. You didn't get to talk back. You got to say yes or no, and they told you. And newspapers, you got to buy them or not buy them, read them or not read them. Walter Cronkite or I Love Lucy, depending on what you want. So the technology was such that the elites could bring all these people. I mean, this was not nefarious. Bringing millions of people, tens of millions in this country, hundreds of millions, pushing billions around the world into modernity, into being affluent, into understanding politics, into being players in the sense of having opinions. Most people, shocking as it might be, had no opinions about anything throughout most of human history because why would they? They were too busy digging their little ditches so they could grow some food. So this is different. Yes, the elites kept their control and their, their monopoly from the top. Basically, information was institutional. The government had its own pot of information. So when the president gave a speech, everybody listened because he was going to say something you didn't know. Today, president gives a speech, you already know what he's going to say before, beforehand. Usually, you know exactly the words. Media had information. So when there was a crisis or something, you turned to your television or you bought your newspapers. So it had information. If you wanted to know which products were the best, they owned the information set. It filtered down somewhat, but there was pretty complete monopoly or semi-monopoly of that. And that is, of course, what has been blown up by the information tsunami. You can't put Humpty Dumpty together again. I think that's gone. I think part of the pathology of our moment is that the elites have not reconciled themselves to that. They think, no, that, that's bad. And of course, as always, when your personal authority declines, it's not you who have been downranked. It's a moral disaster that has happened to the world, right? Because I should by all moral rights, be the one that tells all these people, all these deplorables, how they should be behaving. So the elites have taken a very high moralistic tone. Whenever the public puts his opinions forward, they get condemned on moral grounds, on moral grounds. One last thing, the cult of identity, this idea that we are all defined by these weird categories, is magnificent for the elites because they get to condemn and control so many opinions, let's put it that way. They are not going gently into that good night. They're trying to regain control. I'm not sure that's possible. And so we're in this moment right now of reaction. I think the next couple of presidential elections will probably tell a lot, but that's where we are right now. It's the elites trying to head us back into the 20th century, trying to play Hamlet on a stage that has a Marx Brothers movie on it. So would you, if you would apply the same dynamic, we talked about information monopolies and its influence on democracy. If, if we take the same concept and how that's deteriorating, eroding, t taking the same concept and applying it to perhaps other established institutions, is there any institution you would highlight, whether it's a scientific institution or scientific institutions, maybe plural is better, the educational sphere, any other domain that you would highlight that you think is particularly interesting to study outside of the political realm or democracy? But they're all in the same boat, and they are all in the same boat. Education is a disaster, I think, because they are desperately trying to control these ideas that are being fed to young people. And of course, parents are crazy with that. And so now you have this war between parents and teachers. And then, of course, you get these right populists, like in, in my state of Virginia, who then pass laws saying, you can't teach these and you can't teach that. And you're going like, well, that's this is all insane, okay? This is a very insane set of pathologies that we have going here. And of course, the media we've talked about is completely broken and many aspects of it are heading over the cliff into oblivion, okay? The newspapers are dead institutions and they, they won't come back. No, I think it's a scientific institution. We've just gone through COVID for goodness sakes. You had people, the venerable Anthony Fauci saying one day, no, we will never have to lock down. And quarantines are old fashioned. That's their old 19th century and then literally two weeks later, say, everybody has to lock down and hide in your homes and wash your hands and don't come up till I tell you to. And you go like, 
okay, what changed exactly in the last two weeks? No explanation of that. So a lot of contradiction, a lot of enjoying the fact that the public was terrified and was actually obeying, had become docile for a change. Stand up, sit down, roll over, okay? So and we did it. So I think a scientific establishment has come out of the pandemic as bad or worse as a political establishment. I don't know if it's interesting to study, but I think you have to give credit to where credit is due. Uh, I talked about Amazon indirectly, right? And as the, the marvel that you can just put your credit card in a screen, push a button, and then shows the thing you want shows up on your doorstep. So I talk about the loss of trust in institutions and the collapse of hemorrhage of authority that has these institutions basically on death's doorstep. But look at Amazon. Amazon gets a high trust rating. If our government services worked like Amazon, I can guarantee you that people will think much more highly of the government. But let me tell you, both of you guys have been into tech in, in San Francisco. You have no idea. I was inside the government for many years. You have no idea what the government looks like trying to cope with the digital. <laughs> the Marx Brothers doesn't even begin to tell it. It's a tragic comedy, I guess you would call it. it, it there's something about the digital that the federal government just finds totally perplexing it, with the best intention. They always know the words and they think they could, we can do this, we can do that, we can do And then they just blow up. They just have no idea how it honestly really works. I think probably because in the end you have in mind, it's always top down still. And of course, the first thing that happens with the digital is people take over. So trust Amazon, you don't trust the federal government. Both are huge organizations. Both are in essence bureaucracies. Both are dispensing services. But what you see in Amazon is fast service and cheap products. What you see in the federal government is a lot of bureaucracy and condescension and paperwork and delay. Amazon works at the speed of light. The federal government is this gigantic, immobile pyramid who just won't budge. What does a thriving democracy look like in the network world? Part of what my concern is that I keep talking about this profound cosmic transformation, structural transformation we're going through. Part of my concern is that at the end of this, liberal democracy still be there. I mean, it's no, not given that it will be. Many institutions are falling by the wayside. Not necessarily given that it won't be. I don't know that it's democracy. Democracy is a funky word. You probably think you live in a democracy. What does that mean? What does that mean? I just came from Athens. I can tell you what it meant in classical Athens. You showed up at that hill in Athens, Panix Hill, and you had a right to talk along with everybody. There was no real government there. People got elected for very short times. Most of the government was by lot. Day by day government was by lot. So you could be a farmer or you could be an aristocrat, but you were there in that council house running the government, okay? That's democracy, okay? What we experienced in representative government is moments where we get to say yes or no about our governors, or our rulers, and yet we do have trial by jury, and we can express our opinions. We have certain individual rights. It's really a, a liberal republic based on liberal individual rights that has democratic moments of validation, which are the elections. So the network democracy is just more of a weird, weird cultural sense that the web has always conveyed. I think because it grew up in San Francisco, home of Haight-Ashbury and all the hippie movements, a lot of egalitarian idealism, and, and, and the web soaked that up, basically broadcast it to the world. While Ghanim, that's the way he operated, way out there in the Middle East. It was he, no different than if he had been in Silicon Valley. And I think it's a sense of egalitarianism. We're all equals here. I, we all deserve a voice. That's why we invented the internet. Nobody's better than anybody else. So the public, as I said, looks down on leaders and feels that look what happens to anybody on the web who suddenly goes viral. Within a month, that person has been just slaughtered, <laughs> brought back down to size. I remember there was a vir viral video done by this very small outfit about, oh, I forget what, again, the name of this African warlord 
they were trying to destroy or condemn because he kidnapped children and had one of these children armies. That thing beat the best artists of the day. I don't know what happened. It's completely, if you had a, a study of how we can never predict viral, that's a good one. Millions upon millions, tens of millions of views. That young man who was the director, he was found like babbling naked in the street a month later because he had been abused so much online. I think people had criticized him and mocked him. It's pretty vicious and there's death threats invariably, right? And there's horrible threats to you and your family. There's this egalitarian that's a pretty ferocious thing. Nobody wants to lift their head up because you know what? They're going to cut it off. What that means is you have no organization. You have no plan, you have no programs, you have no real ideology. So when you gather in the street, the only way you can gather is by being against. I would say digital democracy is really a form of post-hippie egalitarianism. Certain political strands, anarchism, for example, libertarianism, are very strongly represented. Certain others, fuddy-duddy conservatives, Totally crazy lefties, Marxist, Leninist type of lefties, marginal and made fun of. It brings people together. It can generate protest, but it's not real democracy in the sense that there's no mechanism really to coordinate a plan. Democracy is just it's a form of government. The government at the end is doing things. And other than being against digital network democracy, it can't do anything. So how does a politician succeed in this world? I have been asked that a lot, actually. I'm a lot better at describing things than at prescribing things. I don't feel like why anybody should listen to my opinions about things. I feel like I have, if I observe something and I say, look, that's there, you can look and see, right? And you can either see it or not. But if I tell you this is the way you should be, then you go like, why? But that being said, if you look at what inspires the revolt of the public, gross, in other words, not in any given instance, not in any given country, but across the board in all these eruptions from below. You get a couple of major, let's say, charges that are brought against the elites, politicians. One is that you're too distant. You're too distant. You, are, you were my next door neighbor. I elected you my representative. You went to Washington. And you ascend it to Olympus. And so you're dressing differently. You're talking differently. And I can't get you on the phone anymore. And by the way, I don't know what you're doing with all that money that's sloshing around there. And by the way, if I went to Washington and saw your secretary, she looks a little too sexy. What's going on there? What are you doing? You're just, you joined them. You used to be us. Now you've joined them. You're too distant. And that's not necessarily false. Back in the day, here in the city of Washington, where I essentially grew up, where I had a little job at the State Department, I was a translator. I had the feeling at that time that I could walk all the way up to the seventh floor, knock on Henry Kissinger's door and say, hi, Henry, here I am. Nobody stopped me. It was just a building where people worked, including the most powerful ones. By the time I left CIA, let me tell you, I had clearances that nobody in State Department, there were very few people, hardly anybody, maybe nobody in the State Department had. There wasn't a question. And I had my badges that showed my clearances. I got stopped outside the building. And I had to show my badges to go through a metal detecting device. I got stopped inside the building. Basically, the distance, count the number of limousines that the federal government had. I think it's actually people have caught on and it started to go down. But for the longest time, there were more and more limousines. More traffic in Washington gets interrupted because some guy from the secretary, the secretary of transportation wants to get somewhere fast. You know, why? So I think if you are a politician, to get back to your question, that's a framework in which we live, right? You have to understand that the web makes you very proximate, very near to the public. There have been politicians that got that. Unfortunately, they've been crazy people, like Trump or like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, but they do that really well. Trump says he's not going back to Twitter. Big mistake, maybe a fatal mistake for him. Cortez, she it's not just about politics, right? It, she has videos, Instagrams, where she talks about her nail polish or whatever the heck. So you see her as a human being. See her as a human being. I think she's now ascending into the red carpet thing, and that's probably not good for her, but they get it. You can be proximate to people. You can kill that distance to zero online. You need a class of elites and politicians who understand how to use the digital not as having your PR person and your communications person pretend that it's you tweeting or whatever like that. You have to be the person 
there has to be a personality. The digital world is about personality. The old elite world was about institutional, it was like Walter Cronkite. You had no idea what his personality was. He just sounded like an important authoritative person. Turns out he wasn't, but he sounded like one. That's one thing. I think there needs to be a lot more transparency. I think the public also accuses the politicians of failing them, particularly in, in economics, that they fail and they never, ever blame incompetence. They blame corruption. They feel like the elites are basically feathered. They're basically in business for themselves. I think there has to be more transparent, which you can do online, demonstration of how business is done, how the sausage is made in government. So that fear that there's corruption and there is even theft, the uh, elites and the politicians are feathering their nest that they're there not to represent you, not because they want to promote the national interest, but because they want to make money and be famous and make money. I think that has to be taken care of in some ways. How is it that somebody can spend their life in politics, like say a Bill Clinton or a Barack Obama? And upon leaving the presence, they're millionaires. I don't understand how that works myself. Either you make that transparent, all right? How do these people make their money? And maybe one way that would be acceptable to the public is to say, you can't stay in politics forever. You got to move on. If you're a representative, you get one shot and then move on. Then you can be a senator, move one shot, move on. It's all very opaque how you get to be a politician for 50 years. And at the end, you're a millionaire. Let me tell you. I know the salaries in Washington. You don't get to be a millionaire on the salaries in Washington. You guys in, in technology, you get to be millionaires. We bureaucrats, we don't get to be millionaires. And basically, elected officials are high-level bureaucrats. Beautiful. What are the key questions a citizen should ask themselves in a networked world? Yeah, that's a good one. I like that question a lot. I think we need to take ownership of ourselves. And I think this idea that you project all this criticism, all this repudiation, all this negation out onto the institutional world is a cheap and, and ineffective form of therapy, right? Or of avoidance even. I think we ought to all, our harshest questions ought to be our, about our own behavior. What am I doing wrong? What ought I to change in my interactions with my, my family, my community, my fellow citizens. How have I contributed to either making things worse or making things more functional and better? How should I behave myself? This is something I ask myself all the time. How should I behave myself when you go into this online world? I publish my stuff, and I tweet, right? How should I behave? What words should I use? And if you want fame, you want to be an influencer, if you want to be a celebrity, you're probably using all the wrong words. I can tell you from my example, because I haven't become any of those things. I have desperately tried to be controversial in certain articles that I have written. And I think there's something pathetic about the way I write them is nobody cares. Nobody gets angry at me ever. So I keep waiting. I mean, the best thing that could happen to you in the digital world is a controversy. If somebody goes crazy over something you've written and then suddenly you're a hero to somebody. That never happens. One question I'm been sitting with, listening to you, with all the turbulence that has, I guess, manifested over the last decade, especially in the last five years, there's really never been any collapse, societal collapse. Let's talk about the U.S. People still have drinking water. People still have food. Yeah, there's a lot of turbulence in the political realm and in the digital realm, but it's never really propagated through to Maslow's hierarchy. Most people in the U.S., still able to feed themselves to sleep at night and so forth. Why do you think there has been no sort of full-scale societal collapse? That's another good question. Let's step back. I come from Cuba. I have nothing but pride from where I come from. But when it comes to institutions and politics, the Cubans are crazy. Do you look at the history of Cuba, which as I have studied it, it's a crazy history. There is something profoundly dysfunctional about the culture there. I came to the United States, alas, those were different days. One of the very first things that I noticed was, damn, and I was a young kid, nobody talks about politics in this country. That's all that obsessed Cuban, all that obsessed. Being a Cuban is like being in the, 20, in, in the year 2022. They, they, we have Cubanized the United States, but I believe that 
people that I came to way back still exists. So I think that a lot of the noise happens in the front of that stage. I think in the backstage, it's not maybe a Marx Brothers comedy at all. It's just everyday life. I think a lot of the noise is by the most extreme, it's, it has to be the most extreme voices because otherwise, if you are, like I said before, if you try to speak moderately, who the hell cares? Nobody listens to you. And I believe fundamentally in the sanity of the American people. And, and I think, yes, it's undergoing sort of a psychotic episode right now. And uh, you have to acknowledge that. So let's not get too rosy to the glasses we wear. But fundamentally, the American people are sound. And not only have, I, have we not collapsed societally, we are not shooting at each other as we did in the Civil War. So we have come nowhere near the state of division and partisanship and bitterness that we did in the 1950s and 60s over slavery. I always say I'm a long-term pessimist and a short-term optimist. And I think the psychotic, psychotic episode will pass. And I think uh, the American people will grab a hold of their future. And you could very well see a far more democratic future because I think in the end, the digital allows that, allows a far more participatory, a far more structure than what we had in the 20th century. You, we're just going to have to work at thinking what that is. That's the first thing we need to do is start thinking about structural change. Nobody's talking about that. That's very depressing for me. We all get lost in policy questions, immigration, yes or no. I mean, it doesn't matter. Whatever you say, it's going to spark a revolt on the other side, the people who, who disagree, right? A system that puts all those voices in one place and somehow manages that in a way that, that's not dysfunctional. I think that can happen. Like I said, we have altered our government. We went from that republic of gentlemen to a republic of mass organizations during the progressive era. And we can do that again. We can have a digital version of what the founders, those very brilliant men, intended for us. Did you mean short-term pessimist, long-term oh, yeah. optimist? Yes, short-term pessimist, long-term optimist. That's the uh, opposite? I think so. Oh, sorry. Briefly, what are some of those structural changes that you mentioned? What are some of those structural changes that might be necessary? We talked about one thing, and that's actually not as structural as behavioral. The elites have to behave differently. The other one is we need government services that are more like Amazon than like the Great Pyramid of Giza. We probably should not think in terms of one size fits all anymore. That's a 20th century way of thinking. So if you, again, impose some federal law, like the health care bill, all the way down, ram it down from the top, then again, you're going to spark a revolt. Half the people will be against it, at least. So you should go down to the local levels. Our communities are a lot less divided politically than the country is as a whole, right? So if you pass a healthcare law, you should be able to make it sort of like adjustable at the state level, at least, for what that state considers it to be its way of life. Why would you be trampling on somebody else's way of life, right? If you have a very liberal way of life, why should you force conservatism on it? If you have a very conservative way of life, why would you enforce uh, progressivism on that? And I would point to the Swiss. I think in the future, every democracy will be Switzerland if we work it out right. In Switzerland, for example, it's the cantons, the little valleys that count. So if you want to become a citizen, you don't become a citizen of Switzerland. You go around your canton and shake hands. And the vote is in your camp. And they say, yeah, we know this guy. He's been around a while. He, he could be a Swiss. And that way, if the vote is no, let's kick him out, then nobody can come up and say, well, what a racist decision because it was us that did that. Or if the vote is yes, nobody can say immigration is too loose. They would, because why? Because it was us who said he could come. It's much more democratic at the lower levels. That's always true. When you have a gigantic nation of 330 million people you have to break it down. That's what I think our founders intended. And I think the 20th century, for very good historical reasons, changed that and brought it back down to be more from Washington oriented. I think, like I said, we're fragmenting, we're in a fragmenting age. And I think, therefore, we need to bring this decision making down to the state and local levels.
would you be able to offer us a, a glimpse into what you're currently working on? I'm fascinated with ideology and the fact that there isn't any. <laughs> I grew up in the golden age of ideology. There were these crisp, coherent sets of ideas that ended in a specific way of life, a, an ideal way of life, right? So pure communism over here or liberal democracy over there. And, and it is fascinating to me how no matter what side you're on today, there's this appalling poverty of ideological thinking. But Americans in general are not very ideological. I'm fine with that. In the end, it's what you do now, what's the ideas you have in your head. But you need certain ideas to get to where you want to go. And so I did a paper on the right populist ideology, which it, they don't have any. It's completely incoherent. But that's going to probably appear in, in the City Journal in, in January. I'm working right now on more like the identity, a cult of identity ideology. And again, it has, doesn't have any. And, and then a somewhat broader, using that to look at why there is no ideology. Why are we failing at that? Having come from this golden age, <laughs> why are we in such a terrible moment where explanations are so shallow and rest on nothing? If you could accuse somebody and say, we live in a systemic racist country, what does that mean? How does that compare to me? When I came to Virginia, it was a systemic racist state, okay? Jim Crow was here in Virginia. I know what systemic racism looks like, but what does it mean now? Why are you saying those words? What set of ideas make you feel like you say those words? And then you puncture that set of incoherent statements and you realize that there's nothing there. There's no coherence. And try to understand why that is. The digital tower of Babel that we live in probably has something to do with that, but there are other factors. So that's one of the things that I'm interested in right now is that the reaction of the elites, the elites have changed since the book was written. They're now in full bloom reactionary mode. They want to take control of the web. They want to boot out the people they don't like. That's an interesting development. That's different. Can that succeed? I don't know. That's an open question. Is there a date for when the book will be published? Well, it's not a book. I actually have a, a book in the works of essays that I published in Discourse magazine. Hopefully that will come out next year, but no, I'm just writing articles, essays, trying to get down, doing research mainly. What I do is research. I love research. Research is great. I did, and, and the stuff bubbles up and the stuff bubbles up, I write it. And so I, I've been interested primarily on that, the ideological feebleness of our moment and the reactionary moment of the elites when they are, they seem to be trying to regain control and the question of whether that's possible in this gigantic tsunami of information. We will move to our very last section, which we call the outro section. And we try to keep this rapid fire. Okay. There are these five questions which will be coming, some from myself and some from Eric. I'll start. What motivates you? Research, learning, different, new. Which non-consensus views do you hold near and dear? I'm temperamentally non-consensus. So my trouble is trying to figure out <laughs> how do, why do people think consensus? I don't know. I, I, it, it, and I think that is a temperament thing. It's not that I am a non-conformist. I would love to conform. I just never can. Your default back is That's yeah. great. <laughs> what or who has had the most impact on your thinking, career, or life? Well, of course, my family, I have to put number one, my wife, number two. That would be a different human being if I had married my wife and not better. But intellectually, I would say I have certain philosophical sources, people like Karl Popper, for example, his book on the open society had a gigantic impact on me. It's funny, whenever I reread that book that I do pretty often, I see myself having written stuff from it that I didn't even realize. And finally, some of the people that I worked with at CIA and around, and I've been so fortunate. I have known so many smart people and they're all inspiring and interesting and have given me lots of stuff to think about. What are you currently reading? Well, I'm reading a book, A History of the CIA, but that's a real anomaly for me. So I actually got commissioned to write a review on that by a guy called Rodri Jeffries Jones. You might not guess it, but he's a Brit. But for me, I'm really enjoying Dipping back into William Faulkner. And if you guys haven't read A Light in August, it is one of the great novels in American literature. What a tremendous thing. Who are your favorite writers or podcasters? Yeah, there's a whole crowd of them. Barry Weiss, 
is wonderful. Yuval Levin, he is, I love his stuff. Matt Taibbi, for example, if you want to learn about the real dirt on the media, because he was in it, he know, in a way that I found, I find really fascinating. I write about media, but I've never been media. This guy was in it and he knows exactly what people expect of you and how that terribly short, everything falls. Matt Taibbi's a good one. Glenn, Glenn Greenwald does that too. Michael Schellenberger from close to where you guys live. I believe he's in Berkeley somewhere. I met him uh, at a conference and I was just taken with him. His Read his book, San Francisco, if you haven't yet. It's an amazing thing. And he has a sub stack that I, that I have subscribed to. So there's quite a number of people. I feel like in my, uh, again, I've been fortunate in my professional life as being, as I said, a nut duck who never quite lands in the middle of anything. That I've had these little groups of people who have been so smart who have helped orient me in what's important and how to think about things. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For more information and latest updates, visit us at luminary.fm or follow us on Twitter at luminaryfm. Please subscribe to the podcast, pop us an iTunes review, and share with friends. Don't forget to check out the show notes. And a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this episode by the hosts and the participants are solely those in independent capacity and do not in any way represent the views from any organization, company or management they may be associated with. And thank you for listening.